grew up in Batavia, Illinois, and I started going to Chapel Street when I was in fifth grade. Whenever I come back here, I'm immediately pulled back to my roots. I feel like Chapel Street just brought me up in Christ and taught me about serving, and I think it's contributed a huge amount to who I am today. Those experiences started when I was really young, and they gave me opportunities to see people in different walks of life and really challenged me to think about my own life and how I could someday give back to local communities. While I was studying business, I was working at a restaurant for three years. And I was having trouble with my health and I was really going through a hard time. And the Lord led me to this church and all of a sudden it just came onto my heart. Like, Amanda, you're supposed to be listening to this. And I, I didn't know why, but since I was 12, Africa, this idea of serving people in Africa, I don't know why, but it was always on my heart. And so the second that I'm sitting there, I just, I knew. In 2014, I left for Rwanda. I committed to an organization called Hope for Life Ministry. In Rwanda, there's anywhere between 7,000 and 10,000 homeless youth. So our organization is focused on serving as many of those guys on the streets as we can. A lot of them on the streets, they have just enormous health concerns right away. And so we are focused on immediately getting the health better, then nutrition. Following that, it's trying to get them enrolled in school. So as you can imagine, getting boys enrolled in school that have been living on the streets is extremely challenging. For one, most of these kids, if they have been going to school, it was years ago, so we're needing to catch them up. And the second is just behaviorally, they need a lot of time and patience. So it's definitely a process, and it requires all of our staff members to be engaged and giving care and attention to these kids. And it's one thing to be able to give a kid food and education. However, if he has not worked through the physical trauma, the sexual trauma, anything that he's endured, it's not enough. One thing that Hope for Life does extremely well is our care for these boys. It's sitting with kids, knowing where their hearts are, and then working with them to heal them. And I continue to get to see so much healing, and it's changed me in ways that I can't even fathom. And it's beautiful, it's beautiful what God does for these little ones that now they're they go from such hard times and to be able to think about where they were, that's why I continue to stay. And God has just been putting on my heart, love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love others. And I've been thinking, love others. Why love others? And I think it's because God created us to feel joy in watching someone else's life change and joy in loving people and I think our hearts they feel so good when you can love and when I'm in this home for boys I have no greater joy and I think God wants his best for us and that's why he's asked us to love people and to serve them that is where our joy is going to be found to be able to continue to see these boys grow and heal and transform and to know without a shadow of a doubt that their lives are different. It's been amazing to be a part of. Some of you may remember the uh, video we showed a number of years ago with Amanda Good and the little boy Fred who was missing a leg and had his leg restored through Cure Ministries. And we've had a long relationship with her, as you've heard. She works for Hope for Life, and she uh, grew up in our church, grew up in Batavia. And uh, it's just amazing to see what God is doing and to hear the stories. And she came to us a number of months ago and said that, um, you know, we, she's a Serve the World partner. When you give to Serve the World, it supports a number of different missionaries and ministries. But she came and said, we have one home, and we have a vision to double our capacity to build a second home just like it on the same property. She said, we have the property and we have the staff. We don't have the resources to build it. And we have a chance as her home church to do that for her. There's a company that will match our giving, and so the cost is about $120,000. We're praying by God's grace and our generosity we could raise $60,000. This will be our Christmas Eve offering. But we want to let you know about it ahead of time. 
to, uh, to give 60000 to be matched to provide a second home for these boys to see what God will do. What a great opportunity we have this Advent season to do something like that. So you'll see another video with more specifics about the project in two weeks, but wanted you to see this now so you can begin to pray about what God might put on your heart. And certainly pray for Amanda and for the good work she's doing there in Rwanda. We're thrilled to be part of it and to be partnering with her. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord Jesus, you are Israel's strength and consolation, and you are ours as well. And we come to you now and ask you to speak to us through your word and enlighten our minds and hearts that we might receive the wonderful counsel of your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Choosing baby names is tricky business. Do you know this? Moms and dads, grandmas and grandfathers. Uh, yes, there, there are, when, I, when, our, when my wife was pregnant with Noah, we were choosing his name. There's rules I didn't know you had to follow. They aren't written down anywhere. They aren't, they're sort of unspoken. For example, if you or your spouse has ever dated somebody, those names are off limits forever and always to the end of time. You can't pick those names. And you might like that name, but it, your wife would tell you no. But hypothetically, you know. Or if you or your parents or your spouse or your spouse's parents knew somebody when they were children that was weird or odd or strange that had a certain name, that name is off limits for your children as well. You might not know that either. And you have to think about first name, last name, and how they match up. I had a good friend in high school whose name was Anthony Sharoni, Tony Sharoni. <laughs> Charles Stuck, Chuck Stuck. Two real guys that I played high school football with. I looked up some funny names that people don't think about how the first name goes the last name. I'm not making these up. Uh, uh, a woman who's born into the Mann family, M-A-N-N, they, they named her Anita. <laughs> I'm not making it up. The Wright family, W-R-I-G-H-T, named her Eileen. You have to think, I know. I'm not making these up, but I think they're awesome. Or uh, Lois Price. <laughs> My dad would like that name. Okay. In, in the Bible, in the Word of God, names are very significant, not just not jokes to, to amuse us. Very significant. Some of you know this. We see repeatedly names that people, and they come into a relationship with God, they have their name changed because names held deep significance about who you were and what your destiny in the world was. The people of the Bible took naming very seriously. And we're going to examine four of the names of Jesus from the Old Testament. In fact, those four names from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, are our series. And he shall be called the four names of the Messiah given to us. These four names are all found, as I said, in one chapter, one book, one chapter, one verse, Isaiah 9, 6. This prophecy was given by God through the prophet Isaiah to the people of God, to Israel, at a very dark and insecure and confusing time, written about 750 years before the birth of Christ. In the midst of a divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel was already conquered, the southern kingdom of Judah was in disarray and under threat by the Assyrian Empire. The people were fearing for their lives, their safety, their security. And God speaks to the prophet these words. If you have your Bible, we're gonna, if you don't have your Bible, the, some of these will be on the screen. We're going to be jumping all over the place in the Bible today. So there's one in this pew back in front of you. If you want to follow along with us, you certainly can do that. Isaiah chapter 9, we'll read the first seven verses to give us some context for these names. Isaiah 9, verse 1. Is there a buzz in here? Is it just in my head? I don't know what, I'm hearing things. Maybe it's in my own head. I'm going crazy. Good. Buzz. There's a buzz. That could be a good thing. Probably not. Isaiah 9, 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. You have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, 
and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's, it reads differently, doesn't it, when you put it in context. It's a very famous passage, a very famous verse. We sing it, we hear it, sung in Handel's Messiah every year in the Advent season. And there's way too much in here for us to go verse by verse, but we're just going to focus on a couple of things. This context, though, I hope gives you a sense of what this would have meant to Israel's people. Threatened on all sides, seeing the kingdom crumble, already divided, in threat of being wiped away by the Assyrian Empire. Violence, every garment rolled in blood, the prophet says. All of that's going to disappear. How? Why? Because of a child? Because of a baby? People living in uncertain and insecure times, people morally and spiritually darkened, we're told. This, first I want to focus on the promised and the gift. To us, a child is born and to us a son is given. That word given is crucial. Jesus did not just appear randomly. The Messiah did not just show up. He is a gift. He is given. He is appointed. Given to us. Why was he given? The Nicene Creed says for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He's given for a purpose and for a reason. For us and for our salvation. Because the context, the people living in darkness... The people that were persecuted, oppressed, insecure, confused, lost. That's why he's given. He's given his light and his hope in a dark world. We read this in John chapter 1, don't we? That the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. We, John chapter 3, men love darkness, Jesus says, but the light exposes them. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. I know I will skip ahead from Psalm 78 to Ephesians 4, verses 17 and 18. Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. From Genesis 1 to Revelation, the story of the Bible, you could make the case, is a story of light shining in darkness. By the lights coming on. God turning on the lights, shining the lights into the world and into human hearts. Isaiah verse chap chapter 8, verse 22, right before the prophecy in chapter 9, listen to the description of the condition of God's people and of the world. This is actually a description of the context in which God's people were living. They, the world, will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Not a very pretty picture. Where will people look? But it's not just a description of the world at that time in the ancient world. It's a description of our world and of every one of us without Christ. That's what Paul's saying. There is a darkness and a confusion and a lostness in which we exist. There's also a darkness, morally and spiritually, in our own hearts, which we don't really want to face. You could say that Advent, then, is the season of anticipation of God turning the lights on, bringing the light into the world. Remember that phrase in the beginning in chapter 2, or chapter 1, excuse me, of, of Isaiah 9, in the, in the contempt, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali? But he'll make great and glorious Gentile or the Galilee of the nations, of the Gentiles. That's what the word nations means. Why, why, would, why is that in there? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, we read these words. Now when he heard, that's Jesus, that John had been arrested, that's John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations or Gentiles have seen a great light. And those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, 
on them a light has dawned. This is the story in Matthew 4 of Jesus beginning his public ministry, sort of coming out into the light, as it were, with who he is and what he's about. The next verse, which we didn't read, is that he begins to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The message of the kingdom is the message that light and hope has come into a dark world in the person of Jesus Christ. And this was written, Isaiah 9, 750 years before we read those words in Matthew 4. So don't let your familiarity with this passage, it, it's so easy to do. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, you can almost hear the song in your head. Don't let your familiarity rob you of the power of this. What's God's answer to darkness and confusion and insecurity in your heart and in the world? Five principles you must follow. Three rules to live by. Six things to do. No, what's his answer? A child, a son, to give you the gift of a child, of a son, of a savior. He's light in a dark world. This brings us to the child and his name. Isaiah tells us this child has four names. That's our series, as I said. He shall be called. And we're going to just meditate and focus on for the rest of our time this morning on the name Wonderful Counselor. The child born in a manger is the Wonderful Counselor. We have to do some work to understand that title, those names, that, that name, those words. You and I need his wonder and his wisdom. First, the word wonderful is the Hebrew word Pele. It means great soccer player from Brazil. No, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that. It, it, it is Pele, but it literally means beyond understanding, astonishing, causing one to wonder, filling a person with wonder. The word in English, wonderful, literally means full of wonder. But we use it like we use the word awesome or great. Like it's, it's a, it was a wonderful evening. It was a wonderful movie. We had a wonderful dinner. It was a, what a wonderful child. What a wonderful service, you know. We just say it all the time. It means nothing to us. But it's a significantly powerful word here in Hebrew. To be overwhelmed with a sense of awe and wonder. When's the last time that happened to you? To be overcome with wonder and awe and amazement at who God is and what God has done. When Ma in Matthew 18, when Jesus says to his disciples, unless you change and become like this little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I wonder if that's what he's talking about. Recovering childlikeness, not childishness, that's selfishness, but childlikeness, to be full again of wonder and joy and awe. You know, little kids are amazed at the world, aren't they? What happens when you grow up? Those things which used to cause you wonder are like, eh, seen that. Been, it's not that exciting anymore. I wonder if Jesus is saying to us, recover that sense of joy and awe at who I am, at what I have done, at what I'm doing, at what I will do. Abraham Heschel in his book, God in Search of Man, says the beginning of, any true, of all true religion is the sense of awe and wonder, which is very close to worship, moving you to express praise. The child given or born to us is wonderful, and he fills our hearts with wonder. In other words, you might say that which requires God as an explanation is wonderful. What's wonderful? Anything that requires God as an explanation. Read through the stories of the Old Testament. Psalm 78, which we didn't read, but there's, it's, a, it's a record of how Israel forgot to pass on the wonders of his works and who he is to the next generation. And bad things happen when you lose sight of the wonders of God in your heart and in the world. So wonderful to fill you with wonder beyond explanation, causing amazement, astonishment. Then the word counselor, this is the Hebrew word yoetz, pele yoetz, wonderful counselor. When we hear counselor, you maybe think therapist or camp counselor, right? That's English, it, we lose something here. It means literally royal advisor, legal consultant. Kings would have advisors and counselors. The greatness of the king was often measured by the greatness and the wisdom of his counselors. But Isaiah 40, which we won't read, tells us that this is the king who needs no counselor, who has no counselors. Who consults? Who does he consult when he established the foundations of the world? But Jesus does not come into the world to be your therapist, to be your life coach, 
be your camp counselor. He is the wonderful counselor to fill your heart with the wonder of who he is. Look, listen to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. This is just two chapters after this great prophecy. This is about the root of Jesse. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. That's wrapped up into what it means that Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Now, popular psychology tells us that the answers you seek in life are largely inside of you. That what you need is to be healed from your past, to forgive yourself, to develop self-esteem, and to look inside and find your true self. Because what you seek is internal. So sort that out. Now, there is some truth that we need inner healing and that there's something inside of us that God made that's good. I'm not saying it's all bunk. But the message, but mostly, no. <laughs> but the message of Advent is not look inside, brothers and sisters. The message of Advent is what's inside will not save you. What's inside will not turn the lights on. What's inside will not get you out of the darkness and insecurity and confusion and corruption that you experience. It must come from outside of you. On those living in the land of the shadow of darkness, a light has dawned. Light shines into the darkness, John 1 tells us. When we find this, you know, I think I, one of the things that strikes me about Christmas every year is that our culture embraces Christmas in a way it does not embrace Good Friday or Easter. Have you ever thought about that? I think it's because we, we think Christmas is, you know, it's a pretty affirming message. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, that's a good thing. You know, baby in a manger, I don't know what it means, but it's nice and it's cute and, you know, we sort of sentimentalize it. The Santa Clausification of God, you know, he sees you when you're sleeping, he's going to do good things if you're a good boy or girl, and it's a nice message. But if you think about what the prophet Isaiah is saying to us, the message of Christmas is fundamentally subversive. It's unsettling. It's saying the wisdom of the world has utterly failed. You are living in a land of darkness and shadow and confusion and insecurity, and it's of your own making, and you will not find your way out of it by your own wisdom, by your own counsel. You must have the lights turned on for you. The counsel of Christmas is that the wisdom of the world is flawed. It fails you. Now, if you stop and think about this for just a minute, it means that the counsel or wisdom of Christ ought not to fit neatly with the wisdom of our culture. Think about that for just, if this is true, if you can't look internally and find the answers, if the lights must be turned on for you, if it must come from outside of you, then that should by definition mean that the counsel of Jesus, the wonderful counselor, should be, should chafe against prevailing cultural ideas. We should find it not always easy to understand or to grasp or to accept. It should not fit neatly into the conventional categories of our culture. Because he's not offering us human wisdom. He's offering us himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 28, the Apostle Paul speaks about this, saying, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. God took what the world sees as confusing and foolish and ridiculous and made that our salvation, divine wisdom. If everything you ever read or heard from God was always easy to swallow, fit nicely into your categories, and never unsettled you, that's not a good thing. C.S. Lewis writes that when we find God easy to understand all the time in our reading of the Bible, perhaps it's not God that we found, but God of our own imaginations, God of our own ideas, God of our own understanding. Let me just ask you, when you read through the Word of God, when you read the counsel of God, does it ever confuse you? 
Do you ever find yourself going, I wish he hadn't said that? <laughs> I don't like that very much. How do I square that with my experience of my own family or my own life? If that never happens to you, perhaps it's not <laughs> the counsel of God you're hearing, but of your own conscience, of your own thoughts. Lewis again writes, when he says, I want God, not my idea of God. Because my idea of God is flawed. It might be at best imperfect. Uh, Tennyson in his poem, In Memoriam, says, Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. I love that stanza. Our little systems, our little theological systems for understanding God, are, they have their day, they're helpful up to a point, but at best they're broken lights. And God's more than them. And you've got your systems and your ideas, and I've got mine. And God in his mercy wants to smash those things to give us more of himself, the real thing. So we should not be unsettled when our culture says, wait a minute, you Christians, you're holding to a truth that just doesn't jive with, with what's law now or what is acceptable now, and you need to get with the historical times here. We should expect certain things that God says for people to outside of his family and his kingdom to go, what? Huh? It should even cause us to do that. Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 12 and 16. Again, the Apostle Paul says, explaining how we misunderstand this. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the th things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See what Paul is saying? Two kinds of people in the world. Those on whom the light has dawned and those who it hasn't. Spiritual and natural, he calls them. It's not superior or inferior. It's not smarter or dumber. It's simply those who have surrendered to Christ and understand something that was not understandable before Jesus made it clear by his Spirit. You don't think your way all the way to the message of Advent. It defies conventional wisdom and human understanding. You must have the switch turned on. Uh, William Wilberforce, if you saw the movie Amazing Grace, about, uh, or if you've read the book, he writes about his uh, conversation with William Pitt, who was the prime minister at the time in England, and he says that he, sa Pitt, he was witnessing to his friend who had a belief in God, but it was vague in general, not a personal uh, relationship with Christ. He encouraged him to go hear this preacher that was so meaningful to him. And he went and heard the same sermon repeated at a revival meeting that Wilberforce had heard. And Wilberforce had talked to his friend, William Pitt, about how it thrilled his soul, it lifted his mind uh, to wonder at, at how amazing God was. And Pitt came back and said, I don't have the first faintest idea what that man was talking about. Two brilliant men hearing the same message. One's heart and mind soars. The other goes, huh? This happened to me. I, uh, years ago, a man in our church was uh, growing in Christ. He was a new believer and was excited about the things of God. And his brother who was um, sort of a nominal churchgoer, but far from God. Uh, this is back when we used to repeat the sermons. Remember those days? We'd preach it here, preach it there. And he told his brother, you've got to go hear this sermon by Pastor Jeff. Not because I'm great, because the Word of God has power. And, and he said, you've got to go hear him preach. And so this, his brother did, kind of grudgingly. And he came, the two brothers, same family, same town, same DNA, same church, same sermon. One is growing in Christ and being thrilled by the wonders of the counsel of God. The other one's wanted to make an appointment to nitpick with me over my understanding of the Sadducees. Totally missed it. I won't t get into the specifics of what the sermon was on. It was what his brother needed to hear about accountability and confession. What's, what's happening there? How can two people hear the same thing? And Paul says it. Not everyone thinks the counselor is wonderful. The light has dawned in this world because Jesus has come, but the light must also dawn in your heart so that you can come to know that he is indeed wonderful. And the counsel Jesus offers you is not advice on your agenda, not life coaching to help you succeed, 
but the gospel itself, the message of who he is, what Paul says is folly to the world. In 1 Corinthians 1.24, we're told he's the wisdom and power of God. Paul says in Romans 1 that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Christ, the wisdom and power of God, and the gospel, the power of God. He is the counsel himself. He's not coming to give you advice or six rules to live by or things you have to do or ways to clean up your act. He's coming to give you himself. That's the counsel. Surrender to him. Give your life to him. Which of us doesn't need that wisdom and counsel in our lives? Which of us is just fine going about our day, making all of our decisions, living our lives apart from that counsel, that wonderful counselor? Can you really afford to go through your life without the wonderful counselor? Some of you have tried, as I have. Ends up badly. Can we even call him wonderful counselor if we're not consulting with him or listening to him? And our wonderful counselor is not aloof or unaware of what life is like here on earth. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, the author tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why was the counselor given? Why was the son who is the wonderful counselor given? Because you need it. Because you're lost. Because you're confused. You can trust his wisdom, Hebrews tells us. You can trust his counsel in every area of your life. He knows. He's been there. He understands. What is, Jesus says when all, the, all walk away in John 8, right? They all turn away and walk away from him. And Jesus says, Where, are you guys going to leave too? To his disciples? And Peter says, where else could we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We, where, where are we going to go? Where are you going to go, friends, if you need counsel? Every one of us at certain times in our life comes up in a place where we need wisdom and insight and understanding beyond ourselves. Where do you go? Google? Facebook? I shudder at the thought, right? <laughs> Good friends? That could be, some counsel would be better than others. Perhaps a Christian counselor, which I can be very helpful, but where do you go? Who ultimately has words of life that you need, that your soul needs? You know, the idea of the incarnation, the child that's given, who is the wonderful counselor, maybe this will help get your minds around what's, what we're really being told here. Years ago, in my, I have a son who's about to graduate college and one who's about to graduate high school. Years ago, when my wife and daughter were out at the American Girl Store, which is the devil itself. <laughs> <laughs> but grandparents pay for it, so that's not bad. It, it's not real. But they, my sons and I were at home. And Noah and Ben were in the basement playing. Legos or Bionicles or Playmobil. I don't know what they're playing. And I was upstairs watching an important game or something like that. Doing heavenly things upstairs. You know, I was upstairs, they were in the basement. And I could hear them making noise and playing, and I could hear the things were escalating. And I could hear, you might surprise us, but pastor's kids occasionally fight. And my sons were getting angry about something that related to the game they were playing and uh, freaking out at each other. And they were yelling at each other and screaming at each other. And I started to yell my wisdom down the stairs to them, my counsel, as it were, right? <laughs> Boys, knock it off. Don't hit your brother. Put that down. I wasn't down there. I didn't know what was going on, but I could sort of imagine that I'd been there before, right? So I'm yelling things down. And you, this might also surprise you. They didn't listen. It didn't work. My shouting down the stairs to the open door didn't work. So what did I do? I descended the stairs, right? I came down to the basement, right? <laughs> down into their world to talk to them face to face. Boys, sit down. What's going on? Let's talk this out. I, I was incarnating, right? The wisdom of the Father to, the, to my children. You might laugh at that, but think about it for a minute. That's what we're being told here. The people living in darkness, confused, fighting, angry, lost, insecure, and hopeless, have seen a great light. God doesn't just shine it from a distance, but comes into the world. He is the wonderful counselor. He comes downstairs, as it were, to the basement, to us, squabbling children. And unlike me, who's just trying to sort out the problem, he is in himself the solution. He is the reconciliation. 
He is the salvation. I want to just give you three simple things, and then we're going to come to the table, which is itself the symbol of the counsel of God. I just want to encourage you this Advent season to trust the wonderful counselor. This might sound simple, but I mean this sincerely. Trust what God says about who you are more than what your boss says, your friends say, or this world says. Who are you going to listen to about your identity? Trust the wonderful counselor. Trust the wonderful counselor about your place and in, in your purpose on this earth, your significance, your destiny, where your life is going. Second, listen to the wonderful counselor. You ever have things in your life, somebody has said something wise to you and you repeat it all the time, like my daddy always said kind of thing, right? There's a couple of things my dad always talks about his father saying. He said it all my life. And I find myself saying things my dad said. Wise words we repeat. And sometimes it can, we can feel tempted. Oh, I've read this before. I know this story. Go back often, daily, moments, many times a day, and listen to the counsel of Christ and trust what he says. And third, most importantly, obey the wonderful counselor. What good is it to go to a wonderful counselor who offers you divine wisdom, which you can get nowhere else in the universe, and think, that's interesting, I've never heard that before, Mm -hmm. I'll take that under advisement, and walk out and do nothing. What what good is that? The hubris of us to think that, right? Yes, this is eternal wisdom for my life, but I think I'll set that aside for now. I'll file that away as important but not urgent. Trust the wonderful counselor about who you are and what your life means. Listen to the wonderful counselor every day. And friends, obey him. Do what he says. He came into the world to turn the lights on in your heart and in mine. I'm going to pray and then we'll come to the table. And I remind you as, as we prepare our hearts now to come to his table. If you're visiting here or a guest here, this is not my table or our table at Chapel Street. It's the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, your wonderful counselor. And if you know him as your personal savior, if you've trusted him for forgiveness of sins and you're willing to examine your own heart, then you're welcome at his table. But in the elements of bread and cup, God is saying something to us, isn't he? He's saying something to you and to me and to our hearts about who he is and what he has done and what he will do. Because the Apostle Paul says that every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are proclaiming the truth, the counsel of Christ, until he returns. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are indeed wonderful. You fill our hearts with wonder. You are beyond explanation. We praise you that you're not like the wisdom of this world. We wouldn't want that. And you're our counselor. You're our advisor. You come alongside us and speak the words of life we can find nowhere else. And now as we come to your table, Lord, prepare our hearts. Counsel us by the wonder of your gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.